screening of the campus for all eight. Um, and I've, my wife was actually trying to talk me into retiring last year, and I wanted to do this one more time. Uh, it gives me the opportunity to meet an awful lot of people I wouldn't otherwise meet. Um, over the four months that it usually takes for the program to come together. So I wanted to thank everyone that I've worked with, but especially Bob Kester. He was one of the reasons I decided to stay around this year. But I will retire in the next two years, and I will not <laughs> be the program developer for uh, greening of the Campus 9. So hopefully we'll get a replacement here. Um, young blood willing to do this for a long time. Okay, now. Um, I've been trying to work in a quote from Adam Smith uh, into this introduction, and it's given me trouble. A lot of people think of Adam Smith the way that we heard last night as the creator of the concept of the invisible hand. He actually wrote a book um, before that called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and in that book he raises the question of how any of us, interested as we are in our own success, make decisions that others find morally and ethically acceptable. And this conference has made me wonder, is, is the answer in our stars? Um, everything we do requires resources. These resources are funded by tuition, by government grants, by the management of gifts and investments by our foundations. The foundation manager has a dual challenge to make an acceptable rate of return while satisfying multiple stakeholders. A few short years ago, the pressure was to divest holdings in tobacco companies, armament manufacturers, and any company investing in South Africa. In essence, the evaluation model was negative. Sherry Don has assured me in our conversations that this is no longer the case, and we will learn a lot more about that from this panel. Dr. Tan is a past chair of the Board of Directors of AISHI and is Vice President for Finance and Operations, as well as Professor of Chemistry at Pacific Lutheran University. She also participates in the University's Sustainability Committee. She will introduce the other panel members, but it is my pleasure to welcome her as the moderator of this morning's plenary panel. <clears throat> Thank you so much. This morning we want to talk about some of the ways colleges and universities can invest their money to make a positive difference in our world. In most schools' mission statements, uh, our school's mission statements for the most part, they say something about student outcomes, something about service, something about the university's role in the broader community, and even something about the future of our planet and sustainability. But at the same time, we're all aware of same, what we've done with sustainability and operations in our universities, curriculum, and the physical campuses and students. A question that's received a lot less attention, however, is how we invest our money. And frankly, in every university, there's a lot of money sloshing around. We have operating budgets, we have restricted funds, we have auxiliary services, which include dining services, bookstores, um, and other kinds of auxiliaries. We have a variety of special programs. We have pension funds, which are a huge amount of money. And we have endowments. Endowments are funds that are set aside, essentially, for the most part, in perpetuity, to earn income for our institutions and to help fund a whole variety of university programs. Often there's a real disconnect between our endowments and what happens with that money in terms of investing and all of the good things we ha hope to do on campus. In this panel today, we want to discuss how to put that invested money to work in ways that help link the university's mission and goals with how it invests its money. I'm going to introduce our panel in the order that they're going to speak this morning. Then I'll make a few introductory comments. Um, our four panelists will speak, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. So be thinking about your questions for our great panel here today. You can read their full bios in the program, but I want to add a little bit to each. 
First, Steve Godekey, over here on my far right, will be our first speaker. He's an independent financial advisor. Uh, he has written a monograph, along with Doug Bauer, on uh, mission-related investing, and it's available on the Internet, and you can download it, and I'm sure he'll say something about that. He is an Indiana native and glad to be back in his home state. And he has a new monograph coming out entitled Maximizing Impact from Strategy to Implementation. It's co-authored with uh, uh, Paul Pomares, and it's uh, being funded by KL Philosophies, Philosophies Foundation and other funders. Steve's going to talk to us a little bit about impact investing this morning, the concept of uh, social and environmental impacts along with financial returns. Next is Francis James, who comes from the Pacific Northwest. And Francis is, at, uh, is vice president at Shore Bank Pacific. And that bank links social investments, links investments with purpose. So he's going to talk to us about socially responsible investing on the part of banks and give some fantastic examples of uh, some of the investments made in the Pacific Northwest and elsewhere. Uh, he is um, from Seattle, as I mentioned earlier, and in some of his other lives has, among other things, been the chef and over owner of a fine restaurant. Next will be Morgan Simon. Morgan is the co-founder of Responsible Endowments Coalition. Uh, a nonprofit that works to improve, so, to prov excuse me, to promote, I can't read my handwriting, to promote social and env environmental change through responsible investments. Uh, she's a graduate of Swarthmore College uh, and was a student leader in one of the first shareholder resolutions done by Swarthmore. Um, she has been featured on the Sundance channel, and if you Google her, you can pick it up and watch her uh, little interview, which is great. Next is Atlee McFellan. He's a grad student in economics and history at the New School, in, New School University in New York City. He's very active in student leadership on campus and uh, currently is an intern at Veritas Wealth Partners and previously did an internship at Dominey Social Investments. Uh, he's a native of Michigan, a graduate of Albion College, and is working on a forthcoming book entitled Understanding the Crisis of the American Empire in all his spare time. As I said before, endowments are a lot of money. Across the country in um, 2000, fiscal 2004, about $267 billion were reported in the National University Business Office, sur Officer Survey on Endowments, or NACUBO. That grew in fiscal year 2008, which was uh, essentially July 2007 to June 2008, to about $413 billion being reported. And unfortunately, in 2009, we're very likely to see that report having a downturn of about 20, uh, 25%, down to about $310 billion but still a lot of money. Now, in that endowment world, of that $310 billion, roughly a quarter of it is held by the five largest endowments in the country. So three quarters by about another 750 colleges and universities, but those five largest schools hold an enormous amount. And those are Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton, and University of Texas. So roughly in uh, FY08, it was about $100 billion held by those five schools. So in FY08, about $300 billion by the next 750 biggest schools and with regard to endowment. That, however, paid out on average 4.4% to colleges and universities' budgets, uh, everything from operating to various kinds of restricted funds, or roughly $14 billion. Now, every school invests its endowment differently. So this pie chart shows kind of the average of all the schools in terms of how they've invested their money. 
So this is just a sample, but what you ought to take away from this is universities have a very diverse portfolio of investments. So the green here, both the light green and the dark green, reflect equities. This can vary from common stock to a whole variety of kinds of mutual funds and can involve investing in the United States or domestically in common stock or mutual funds or internationally. So the 17% you can see in the bottom in the light green is the international investments. And that dollar amount has been growing over the last several years. Now, if you look at the yellow, that's bonds or fixed income. And those bonds can be uh, bonds in corporations. They can be bond, government bonds in some cases. And they can be bond funds. But they're all fixed income kinds of funds as compared to um, equities or investments in stocks. Um, the blue represents a variety of kinds of kind of alternative investments. Um, those things that are called hedge funds in there are actually a whole range of kinds of funds with some very sexy names like global macro and long short or long only or long um, biased uh, hedge funds. Just a whole variety of ways that people have come up with to try and make money. Um, the smaller blue wedges include natural resources. Some schools have a lot in terms of things like forest lands. Other schools have very little. Private equity has been very popular as compared to public funds uh, growing in popularity, but is now at about 3%. Again, some schools have a lot. Some schools have very little. And venture capital are putting forward money for new companies to start business uh, at about 1%. Universities also own real estate. Uh, universities try and keep some money in cash or liquid kinds of investments, particularly since they're doing payouts from their endowment so that it's spendable money. And then there are a variety of other ways people invest money. So this just shows you that universities tend to invest their money very widely in a whole bunch of different what are called asset classes. So if one goes up and another one doesn't do so well, Overall, you come out with a decent rate of return. Now, if we take a look at those average returns that endowments have made, um, in uh, the past uh, 12 years, about seven of those years, there have been very strong positive returns on average. And these are national averages for endowments in general. So, you know, there have been years where they've gone up 10, 15 percent. Now, this can also include new gifts coming in, but a lot of new money coming into endowments in terms of rate of return. You can see five years have been down years, and four years have been down years. And those down years in 2002 and 2003, endowments thought were pretty bad. You know, we were thinking, oh, my God, we're not doing very well right now. Uh, we've had a downturn. Um, 2008 was not a good year on average in terms of a downturn in investments. And this is just an estimate for 2009, but on average, endowments could be down as much as 25%. So we've given up a lot of those returns we've had uh, that were positive in the last several years. Now, you've all heard what Rahm Emanuel said on uh, Wall Street, uh, the Wall Street Journal show about you never, want to wait, you never want to let a serious crisis go to waste. And basically what we have here in the endowment investment world is what looks like a pretty serious crisis. This, I think, creates a lot of new opportunities for us in getting investment committees and people involved in universities in figuring out how to invest their money to think about some different ways to make money while doing good. So I want to turn this over to Steve to talk to us a little bit about some of those ways. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, I want to thank Aishi and, and Sherry uh, specifically for asking me to join you all here at your conference. This is a um, really exciting event and, um, and look forward to uh, talking to you a little bit about this. Uh, as an investment advisor from New York, I'm not going to be 
putting any numbers up, which is kind of a, a strange thing. Um, what, I'm, what I'm calling my, my presentation, hopefully it'll become more of a conversation, is uh, impact investing moving beyond the tyranny of ore. And uh, how I'd like, because I've found as I work with a lot of the uh, foundation, I work primarily with private foundations as they try to align their mission uh, with uh, their investments, with their endowment. And I, what I find is a lot of times it's not really a numbers issue as much as a, a kind of mental issue of how do you frame what you're trying to do. And as one of those, um, as, as, as an anchoring concept, I'd like to read something that Jed Emerson, he is, he's worked a lot in this space. He kind of started it trying to blend the values between social and environmental and investment. Uh, this, this quote, which is, uh, there's an idea that values are divided between financial and societal, but this is the, a fundamentally wrong way to view how we create value. Value is whole. The world is not divided into corporate bad guys and social heroes. And I, and I think, you know, as pe we approach this and you try to think through how to implement this with your, within your institutions, it's very, what, what I think you need to think of this and not in terms of kind of uh, a split between the good guys and the bad guys who are trying to change a bad behavior, uh, but rather um, uh, look at this. The, the idea that, we're, that I'm, we've implemented and are looking at uh, the term we use, and there are a lot of different um, there are a lot of different terms in this space, socially responsible investment, mission investing, mission related investing, uh, sustainable investing, uh, environmental, social and government, governance investing. The, the term, okay, let's see, oh, let's, okay, we click on here. Do you want to continue to unprotect? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The term we're using is impact investing, uh, which is really broken down to its most simple components. And when you start looking at this, I think it's important to get back to the basics of impact investing is when you're really seeking to generate social and environmental impacts in addition to some kind of financial return. Um, uh, and, I, uh, what, and what I would want to do is really, uh, let's see, we do, okay, it's locked up. Let's, Okay. Ah. So moving on to how we, this concept of moving from the tyranny of the or to the genius of the and and stop looking at these trade-offs. Okay. Um, and you may have heard uh, uh, Jim Collins who wrote the book uh, Built to Last and he's not a, um, a socially responsible investment type, he's more of a business methods type. But he, he emphasized how companies really need to stop looking at this tyranny of ore, we, that you, you have to make the decisions but really look that you can um, combine things in an interesting, in a way, the genius of and when making their business decisions, that you, that you don't actually, these false dichotomies that we fall into. And as we see that really impact investing uh, and working with your endowment to combine uh, environmental, social uh, elements into it, you can also do this, but you, also, but you need to, um, you, you can be able to work where you're creating um, new in impact related processes and operating within your investment policy discipline. So you're not throwing all the rule, you're not throwing the investment rule book out the door when you're doing this, but you're combining it with other things. You can optimize for social and environmental impact while still applying the rigor of your investment tools and you can uh, evaluate your performance, your social and environmental performance while still looking that you're going to be getting a financial return. So what I'm really saying here is that I think a lot of people in their minds when they think about impact investing or social responsible investment is that you have to trade off financial return for social and environmental impact. But I think the way to approach this is to say that you can actually look for opportunities to gain on both sides. And I think as, as in, in, the, in the broader, as you may be more familiar with the broader world of sustainability, there's also that, that, that aspect that you can, you can have win-win situations. Not all the time, but a, a lot more than we typically think of. Um, this is pulled out of the, uh, the book, the monograph that I wrote uh, on, uh, called Philanthropy's New Passing Gear. And uh, as uh, Sherry said, 
uh, I'll be happy. I'll, I'll be happy if you want to. If anyone wants to give me their card or let me let me know, I can I can send you a copy of this. It, it kind of lays out for trustees and for board members uh, at endowments or at foundations how to approach this because this idea of combining social and, inv and investment is really a neat concept. But you think, well, how do I actually? What do I do back on Monday morning when I get back to the office, and who do I have to convince to make this happen? Um, these are some of the, these are, we sort of created these five buckets. Um, we didn't create them, but this is how we've, we've combined things that other people have created. Um, and you, some of these you may be familiar with, others you may not. The first two, um, active ownership strategies and screening are sort of more the traditional socially responsible investment. It has to do with your publicly traded um, stocks and bonds in your portfolio, uh, shareholder engagement, um, uh, proxy voting, voting your resolutions, that's what we call active ownership strategies. Screening, uh, as was mentioned earlier, is a kind of do, do you not want to hold tobacco or do you do want to invest in uh, environmentally responsible companies. The, the, the last three are um, some of these may be more appropriate for, for private foundations than universities. But it's really looking at you can do foundations have the opportunity to do below market uh, 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 below market uh, investments where the, the, they're taking a lower return on their investment in order to further a social or environmental um, uh, goal. Uh, you, they can also, out of, out of your endowment, you could do very targeted clean tech investments, for example. That would be the market rate investment. And then uh, in the middle, guarantees, which is, um, I'm doing a lot of work with foundations where they will, as part of their endowment, they will issue a guarantee against their endowment uh, so that through that support, a nonprofit could, can, um, can go out and raise money. Uh, but it's not just a grant from the endowment or, or a grant from the foundation, uh, but rather it's, it's just a guarantee that they, you know, it's kind of like having your parents co-sign your mortgage, but you've got a foundation co-signing it. Um, so those are the five buckets which we had developed in our guide. And what I wanted to do in the last two slides before I, I hand it over is um, look at, is that uh, is large enough for people to see? But this is really when you face the challenge of taking what you want to do as, a, as an organization from the mission side and translating that into concrete investments. So for example, if you're looking at um, affordable housing in your community, you could make a certificate of deposit with a community development financial institution like Shorebank, for example. Um, in education, there are a lot of foundations who are funding and supporting charter schools, for example. Um, and then as you look at um, uh, issues, maybe women's empowerment, that could be microfinance. Uh, there are women-owned businesses. So, there, so the, I think the really interesting piece uh, is when you really try to translate what you're trying to do with, on your mission sh side into very concrete investment opportunities, and those are out there. So on that note, I will hand it over. <coughs> So Shira gets to do uh, double duty today as technical advisor and our moderator. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Francis James. For those of you who came in late, I'm a vice president for Shore Bank Pacific in our Seattle office. And uh, in my presentation today, I'm going to really try to help you understand of the concept of putting money to purpose in terms of how um, your funds at your bank, how they're being used in a, in a socially and environmentally responsible approach. You know, bankers today aren't very popular people because of our ob ob obvious role in what we've done in the uh, financial and, and, and crisis that we've had in the past several years. And one of the things that we know about conventional banking is that, you know, banks, when they invest money in our communities, don't necessarily screen for environmental sustainability or for social impacts. And when we've had to invest in communities, it's because we've had to do it for compliance reasons. And banks, of course, tend to focus on high volumes and transactions to boost fee income rather than work on building relationships, which what community banks tend to be very good at. Now, to define socially responsible banking, I use that interchangeably with sustainable banking, green banking, but in our definition, the bank has to operate with a triple bottom line, that the bank itself has to model and su uh, support sustainable business practices, that we intrinsically believe in the concept of community development 
and that when we choose to lend in the community, those projects have to be uh, in a very sustainable mode, whether a building is LEED or Energy Star uh, certified. To give you some examples of socially responsible banks in, across the nation, in the Pacific Northwest, of course, there's ourselves, our parent company is based out of Chicago, with offices in, also in Detroit and Cleveland. On the East Coast, we have two very prominent community banks, Chittenden and Wainwright, and down, of course, in California, we have New Resources and Community Bank. Uh, there are other examples of uh, socially responsible banks popping up. Uh, there's E3 Bank in Pennsylvania, which is in, in the stage of formation. Uh, we have Green Bank in Texas, and there are a few other uh, prime examples as well. When Shore Bank Pacific decided that we wanted to be uh, setting a role model for sustainable practices, we went to the Natural Step Framework, which was introduced to the United States by uh, Dr. Robert in the 1990s. He's an oncologist from Sweden. Uh, we wanted to follow some very basic principles in terms of how we operate. So these are what we believe is very important for not only financial institutions, but all organizations to adhere to, to really move toward a truly sustainable model of business and operations. We've translated that natural step framework into what we call nine measures of sustainability. And I'm going to move over to the next slide and show you how that works in practice. So these are our nine parameters. And we made this in terms of uh, a color-coded pie chart. There's nine parameters. And an organization can score anywhere from zero for business as usual or conventional behavior to a maximum of three in each of the wedges for truly exceptional or innovative behavior. So for an organization doing extremely well in terms of sustainable performance, you might score out at a maximum of 27, but if you're a business as usual organization, you're gonna be a very low score, zero, one, or two, or three. To show you how that works in practice, let's give you a case study of ourselves. We use this framework to measure how we perform, and going all the way back to 02, we self-scored ourselves in 11. And again, it's not really how important what you score in a given year or time frame, but really how you uh, progress over time. So every couple of years, we revisit our performance. And as of last year, we've moved that score all the way up to 19. So again, it's really the trends which are more important. We use the system for every one of our loan clients on an annual basis. We revisit them. We, provide, we, we do an interview and give them some feedback in terms of how they're doing as a basis of, the, of their relationship with us. We've tracked our uh, carbon footprint since, again, 02. And for the first few years of our you know, tracking, we were pretty steady in terms of our uh, carbon footprint. But over the last four years, we've made some significant improvements. Uh, we've halved it since uh, 05. And now we're about you know, three tons per uh, FTE. This is uh, the office where I work in Seattle. It's in a brand new uh, mixed-use condominium complex. It's uh, lead silver rated. And when we go over to the next slide here, this is the uh, architectural description in terms of all the sustainable features that were incorporated. You can see from the, the first couple bullets there, it's got the future capacity for solar uh, panel installations. It has a green roof, many other uh, beautiful sustainable features. Uh, one of the exhibitors here at this conference is the Better World uh, Books Company. They have they have done a good job of helping consumers and organizations understand when you purchase goods and services, what are some of the more uh, environmentally and socially responsible organizations. So all the community banks I mentioned in the previous slide are all listed as A-class performers in terms of being socially and environmentally responsible. Uh, some of our larger financial institutions who uh, unfortunately have, haven't performed that well in the last couple of years, you can see they don't get a particularly good grade. And now we're going to recap with a few of, of our case studies. Uh, this is an example of a Shore Bank Pacific funded customer that got approved for um, a loan within the last, I think, three months. Uh, we've worked with them for over nine months to really understand their business model. And they are an example of a family-owned business that really understands and embraces sustainability. They are a certified organic farm, you know, 300 acres. And they have, you know, really have understood how to expand their market presence in our community. And they have 8,000 subscribers to their community su uh, supported agriculture program. They ship to Western Washington and Alaska. And what they've done is they've leveraged the um, web technology to make 
your delivery much more customized to your particular needs. So you can actually specify specific things you prefer or do not want in your basket. You can actually have them stop if you're on holidays. Um, so they have a very good way of enabling uh, a very close, intimate relationship between the consumer and the farmer. The thing I really appreciate about Full Circle Farm is that they understand their role in the community. And the sense of them, instead of being not only environmentally sustainable and being profitable, they want to give back to the community. They have a very robust internship program. They have worked with 30 interns over the past 10 years. Ten of them have become owners of sustainable farms uh, as a result of that internship. They're very good at working and providing uh, excess produce to schools and food banks. They do a lot of work in, in environmental restoration programs in our region. This is our most recent example of a, a um, sustainable loan. There's a f company that's about an hour north of Seattle, and they have just uh, finished construction on an anaerobic manure digester. Essentially what they're doing is they're capturing manure waste from a number of large uh, dairy farms in Skagit County, and they're ca capturing the methane gas to produce green power. Uh, as many of you know, methane is a particularly potent uh, greenhouse gas, and whenever we can capture that and mitigate against that, that's a, a very worthwhile project. So this is the classic um, nutrient cycle if, uh, on a dairy farm. As you can see, we're growing crops to feed the cows, to produce the uh, f food for humans, but unfortunately we have a lot of negative products. We have, of course, the methane, we have odor, and we have nitrate runoff into our uh, water tables and, and our, to our um, streams. When you insert now an anaerobic digester, you're capturing the methane, burning it as biogas. That has a green tag attribute to the power. The government's going to give you ta uh, tax credits for that power. You're going to get a carbon offset to help up, uh, fund your operations. And the byproduct of the manure is now a digested fiber, which can be sold back to the local community as a very low cost form of bedding for your cows. So by that very you know, really simple act of inserting a digester into the nutrient cycle, we've provided a lot of environmental benefits to the community. That's a picture of the actual engine that we're using to burn the methane gas to generate power for future cell energy. Uh, so just to really recap, you know, we're providing a sustainable form of power, and we're improving the quality of life for the community as well. Socially responsible banking, in our mind, is really guided by a triple bottom line. Uh, you're spending a lot of your investments in the local and the regional context. You're teaching and helping your customers to be more aware about sustainability, uh, acting as mentors in many ways, and you're keeping wealth in your community. So you need to ask your question, what is your bank doing to become more sustainable? What kind of leadership are they taking to help our community become more sustainable? How do they invest your cash deposits? Uh, and the final words of comments I'll leave with um, this audience today is that, you know, think about diversifying, diversifying your bank portfolio. Work with your uh, community banks in your area uh, and, and invest truly in a community bank that really understands the, the importance and uh, you know, the role of uh, sustainable investing. I can invite Morgan up to uh, the panel. It's always great to be at Aishi. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, so if everyone was in, as inspired as I was by Francis and Stephen's presentations just now and is ready to storm into the treasurer's office with your magic wand to make all investments sustainable, I'm going to talk a bit about the first three steps that one might want to take. And if you're not fully convinced, give a couple more reasons why this might be a good strategy to approach. Um, and to give a little background, as Sherry mentioned, my name is Morgan Simon. I'm the co-founder of the Responsible Endowments Coalition. And we're a network of 95 campuses across the country. We support about 1,000 students, administrators, and trustees a year in implementing responsible investment practices. And that's supporting about $150 billion uh, that's managed by schools in our network. Um, so the first step that I would recommend 
Um, starting out with this, Sherry mentioned there's not a lot of talk about endowments on campuses and we're really missing out on an incredible opportunity to be able to engage in this area of sustainability. So campus education is tremendously important from students up to trustees and responsible investment are not the two sexiest words in the English language. Um, so we've been finding ways to spice it up over time and um, it seems like cows are a theme of presentations today and uh, we wanted to introduce you to a new form of endowment management uh, that some of our students at Mount Holyoke had come up with, which we uh, affectionately refer to as encowment management. And this is the uh, endowment as a cow, which you'll see is, is dripping interest. It's milk every year. And these students wanted just one little bottle of milk, you know, 1% of that endowment to be devoted to community investments in banks like Shorebank. Um, and were ultimately successful in educating their campus community and being able to make some community investments on campus. Um, so there's lots of ways to make it fun. Uh, we do a lot of campus presentations. We're happy to come out to your school. Um, it's a very simple presentation, so I'm just going to leave up my contact information and there's no, no further slides here. Um, the second step that schools tend to do in getting going is to create a committee on investor responsibility. As many of you know from your work in sustainability, you often need to have a really multi-stakeholder approach to be able to capture the insights of multiple members of the college community. Responsible investment in this regard is no different, um, that having a committee with students, administrator, trustee presence can make all the difference in terms of implementation at your school. And in the same way that the school has many fabulous advisors that are looking over the quarterly returns of the school in terms of financial returns, it's important to have equal diligence in terms of looking at the social and environmental impact of endowments. Um, currently there's about 37 colleges and universities across the country that have these committees. And this includes 16 out of the top 20 schools if you look at the U.S. News and World Report rankings. So not to pick on Middlebury who we love and has had their committee active for years, um, but this is not just some hippie schools in Vermont, right? This has become practice of top colleges and universities across the country and is something if you're interested in, we'd be happy to work with you on what might be a model that's appropriate to your school. Um, then the next step, once schools are set up with committees, have a multi-stakeholder presence that's able to shep shepherd the process, is to start looking at the portfolio and what are the opportunities to continue to make money, as Stephen has mentioned, this is no longer an and or proposition, but really how can we maximize value of the endowment and have some fabulous social and environmental impacts. And two easy ways to do that can be by addressing the corporate practices of companies that the school is invested in, and then starting to move some of the as dollars into more proactive venues. So I'm going to give examples of, of both of those. Um, last year we were working with Bard College in New York and they filed a shareholder resolution with McDonald's um, and in a couple months we're able to get the company to agree to a pesticide reduction agreement across all of their potato suppliers and you can imagine what the number of french fries they're producing. They're one of the largest potato users in the US um, and this is going to create standards that will affect all their produce which has huge environmental effects, huge effect for the workers. And then in terms of return for shareholders as it's able to improve its practices and reputation. Um, and this is something that's accessible to, to schools. If you have at least $2,000 worth of stock in a company, you're able to make some pretty significant uh, changes. And uh, we are doing, I'll just put in a plug for this now, at 10 o'clock um, we're doing a workshop in I believe room 122 um, where we will go more in depth into how these processes work. Um, then to talk a bit about moving money, so in looking at proactive investment opportunities like in the Shore Bank Pacific or other institutions, um, we'd worked with McAllister College in Minnesota, which made an investment in a local community bank, which was entirely market rate, so getting the same services that they would have gotten from a Bank of America or a Citigroup, but knowing that they were having these great community impacts. And in addition, they were able to use this as an educational opportunity for the whole college community. They've implemented, through the service learning department, internships with the community bank. They now have an ATM on campus from the community bank, um, and they also use them in their new student and faculty orientations. So it's become really a broader commitment in looking at how is the school really supporting community development, not just with their words, but with their dollars as well. Um, so these are just two of many examples of great things that colleges and universities can do. 
And I also want to note that in both of those cases, it was just a few dedicated individuals working over the course of an academic year. And for many of you who've been conducting campus audits, who've been doing massive sustainability efforts that are multi-year, that take a lot of money and time, this is really going to seem a lot less complicated, even if it might be new uh, to many folks. So those are a couple ways to get started. And in case you're still a little hesitant to get your feet wet, just want to go over what would be my top three reasons for why colleges and universities should be moving in this direction. Um, so the first is what Steve had mentioned, that really at this point we can guarantee you that moving into proactive investment and in taking on corporate practices, you're either going to make the exact same amount of money. Um, given that in engaging with corporations, you're able to stay invested in the same companies, so this is very distinct from divestment, right, where you're going to be taking your money out of a company. In this case, you're able to stay invested, make the same returns that you would have made, but improving practices are able to um, continue to help the company improve its performance. And then in terms of proactive investments, there are opportunities across asset classes um, to be able to make profitable investments. And there's a number of examples of these on our website, which is endowmentethics.org work and, and encourage folks to check out the resources there. Um, the second reason, and I know that none of your schools would ever take on a sustainability initiative for this reason, but it is going to make you look really good. Um, as you may have seen, there's a number of rating tools out right now, the green report card certainly being one of the principal ones, where a lot of schools have been flunking their endowment areas, and we're not going to call any of them out here. Um, but this may have been the case in your school of seeing that one big F, right, marring otherwise what might be pretty good performance. So if you're looking to get your report card grade up pretty quickly, this can be a, a pretty painless way to start. Um, it's also a component of the STARS rating program at ASHE, and it's also part of the President's Climate Commitment. So if these are programs that you're committed to at your institution, this may be one blind spot that would be pretty easy to fulfill. Um, the other piece, I would invite you to picture two alumni magazine covers, right? One is going to say, I'll, I'll pick on my alma mater, so donate back to Swarthmore and you are going to support this amazing CSA program, this amazing community agriculture program, and look at all these happy cows who are having their methane recaptured, right? Or the other alternative is donate back to Swarthmore and you are going to support the decimation of rainforests all over South America through fabulous oil investments. Boy, isn't that great. And that's effectively the message that we are sending every day to our donors. Look at how responsibly we're managing your money. And as Sherry mentioned, they're donating back to schools because they believe in these mission statements, right? That they believe that these schools are working to create a better future for our society. And we need to make sure that that message is really going to be consistent across the work that we do. And for a lot of young alumni like me, where they say the first five years out of school, right, that's the time, even if it's only $20 a year, if you get that alumni donor the first five years, you've got them for life. So if I become the next, you know, social venture capitalist making gazillions of dollars, I want to start that giving pattern early. And if I know that my school is going to manage my money in accordance with my values, it's really going to raise my incentive to donate back. Um, so that can be a great thing to present to the finance office, especially in a time of crisis where we really need to be pulling in new donors. Um, and then the last piece is really, in, in terms of great reasons to do this, is about impact um, and why I've, I've committed the last 10 years of my life to promoting this. Um, that, and we think about what's now 300 billion, you know, give or take 20% these days, of um, money that's managed by colleges and universities. And then we think about how much money has been devoted to sustainability efforts, which is maybe in the tens of millions if we're lucky, right? I know everyone in this room has done really great work trying to devote more resources towards sustainability efforts. If we keep fighting to get those millions in our budgets and ignore that we have $300 billion of collective potential for sustainability, this is one of the greatest leverage points that college and university committees have to promote sustainability. So if you're really looking to maximize impact in a short amount of time, this can be a great place to start. Um, so I'm going to leave it here. I really welcome people if you'd like to join us for the workshop. I'd also like to point out Dan Atfeld, if you could raise your hand, REC's executive director, who's going to be presenting. Um, and also my cell phone number is up here. If folks can't make it to the workshop um, but would like to connect with us today, we will be here all day and we'll be happy to provide more individual guidance on how to get going with your college or university. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Atlee. Um, 
And I, as Sherry said, I'm a student at the new school. I've been involved um, a little bit in, within this uh, investing space. So I'm here to talk um, about my experience at the new school, um, working in this field, setting up, uh, setting up a committee, some of the, the challenges and the barriers and the lessons that I've learned. Um, I thought I'd actually start, since, since we started this morning with a little bit of Adam Smith, I'd start, I thought I'd continue with the political economy lesson um, and uh, uh, say a quote from uh, John Maynard Keynes, who's another economist, uh, who actually uh, said this in response to the, his experience of the economic crisis and what he felt to be a lesson that was learned from the, the great crash of 1929. It's from a, a paper from a friend of mine who's just, uh, just publishing it, uh, I guess, in the next couple of days. Um, as he said, it is the long-term investor, he who promotes the public interest, who will in practice come in for the most criticism wherever investment funds are managed by committees or boards or banks. And though I think we need to add on to the public interest, maybe interest of the, the planet as well, but I feel like, I feel like this idea of the long-term investor, public interest, the interest of the planet is really what we are trying to what we're trying to get at now, we're coming from an experience of very, within the investment world, a very short-term mindset. I mean, how much money was put in uh, subprime mortgages, for instance, and everything associated with them really revol revolved around this idea of short-term gains at the expense of sustainable long-term performance. And I think we're, we're feeling that now, and that's very much central to the idea of you know, whatever label you might want to use for this, and I'm going to get into them, whether it's mission-related investing or sustainable investing or socially responsible investing. Um, I've kind of been involved in, in a lot of different sides uh, of this between organizing demonstrations at my universities and actually a sit-in at the Board of Trustees meeting and then a sit-in at the cafeteria where we didn't leave for a day and a half. Um, to, to actually working in the investment world to be able to articulate the the performance and the funds that are out there to be able to talk about both, you know, talk about both sides and certainly, um, certainly some have been more effective than others uh, in different ways. So um, one of the things that I found really, really helpful is to be able to understand and articulate the different approaches like, like Steve was getting into. So um, I found, you know, discussing mission related investing, aligning one's investment decisions with um, with their values um, is exciting for us being interested in social change and sustainability, but a lot of times, um, unless you're like Sherry who understands the relationship between sustainability and, and investment performance, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to reach people because they see, they see investing and they see finance, they see price to earnings ratio, they see the, the fundamentals analysis, they don't think they, they see values in investing and they, and they run the other way. This has been mine. Um, one of the, another issue that I've run into, um, especially with trustees, with um, socially responsible investing that has made a, a long history of screening out industries like oil and gas, for instance, which is especially important for those of us here. They see that and their automatic assumption is, well, that's going to lower our performance. We don't want to do that. You know, you have to, you have to, have the entire investment world open to you or you're automatically going to be lowering performance. And that really is, I mean, that really is a misnomer. There, there's, some truth, there's some truth in it. Um, sustainable investing is kind of an approach. Um, it's, a, it's a label for a new approach or a relatively new approach that doesn't use these industry screens but, but really sees that uh, incorporating this environmental, social, and governance analysis to more directly into the investment decisions that you make um, will ensure, you know, it, you're, not, you're not screening out industries, but then at the same time you're using, you're using this positive investing approach and it just so happens that you're not going to be investing in, uh, in those unsustainable companies, both socially and environmentally. Um, and really what that's, what that's allowed and what we've seen, you know, especially, especially in these last two quarters in 2009, but even even throughout, uh, even throughout uh, the history of socially responsible, sustainable, sustainable investing, and even, you know, even through 2008 when the market certainly wasn't, wasn't doing well, is that, is that you can talk about this in terms of performance. And the idea is that sustainability isn't just a, isn't just a values-based approach, but the leaders, but those, you know, in terms of commonly traded stock, you know, public equities, those leaders 
in the, in today and into the future are going to be the companies that understand the issues of sustainability and are able to, to navigate these things. The one, you know, the one, the one really, the, one, the, 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 the argument that's used that, that I found most helpful is if you're talking about a company that's doing, that's doing work in an area that you know of that is going to experience severe droughts, say, in, in South America, or there's going to be massive flooding, and they, they really, they're really uh, unprepared for this. They don't take sustainability seriously. Um, they're not going to have the performance. They're not going to have the returns because they're not able and they don't have the capacity, whether at a managerial level, whether at a, you know, at all levels of the company, really able to understand the changing world around them, be it be it poverty in South Africa affecting their workforce, or or rising tides, or rising sea levels, whatever, and that it, that it really has uh, that it really has a significant impact on their on their performance both today and in the future as we see as we see climate change um, getting worse before it gets better as we try to find global solutions to the economic crisis. Um, so yeah, and that that right there is pretty much, uh, you know, me coming from the lesson of organizing a demonstration to advocate for, for something that, that I really approached from a, a values or, or mission-based uh, framework to actually having to deal with the administrators and trustees who had never really heard of this um, before. And, and what I found really helpful in talking with the trustees and the administrators is to, is not just to talk about the sustainability um, and social change in relation to the endowment, which no doubt, as we've heard, you can do, but to also talk about it in terms of risk management, which is something very central to what a trustee, what a trustee in charge of the university endowment does. Like Sherry said, because a lot of revenue for the university is generated by these funds, you know, if they're if they're thinking that they're going to lose performance because of a pro, because of adopting these, you know, adopting these uh, these principles and these frameworks for investing. And you really have to really have to be prepared for that. Um, so I mean that's and that and that really is what it's about. There is there is larger risk involved in the world in, in terms of the environment, in terms of in terms of social dynamics, in terms of understanding governance issues at the corporate level, um, performance as well is obviously central to everything that the that the trustees do with the endowment. And I think uh, I won't go into to numbers here, but there is there is very good performance data on the general world of socially responsible and sustainable investing. Even though when you talk to a lot of more mainstream people in the universities, they will, they will instantly tell you, oh, but it's terrible performance, whatever, we're not looking into this. Um, and reputation, uh, reputation obviously, as, as Morgan was saying, is really, um, really important for administrators and trustees. Um, from, my, from my experience um, in working with faculty to try and you know, reach out to them and get them more involved in this process. Um, curriculum development came up uh, repeatedly. And so, you know, at a university when you're setting up these uh, committees of investor responsibility, there's a lot of different elements where you can incorporate uh, and develop curriculum around it. So, for example, um, in a Columbia University, in addition to the, to the Committee on Investor Responsibility that they have, they have a class uh, designated each semester where students, uh, where students work with a couple different faculty in order to investigate a lot of these issues, not just, not just the issues involved in the shareholder resolutions that they're going to be voted on, but some of the larger, uh, some of the larger financial as well as environmental and social issues involved in the general, um, in the general, uh, in the general space of finance and corporate social responsibility and, uh, socially responsible or sustainable investing. Um, Columbia pretty, pretty much is a, is a leader in this, and I think this is going to be the next step for universities who already have committees on investor responsibility to set up these things. And it really involves, you know, it involves for them the same thing that I really found, um, that it involves for students. Um, something that Morgan said is creating a space for, for, you know, an element of university shared governance, which I think is really important. I mean, it's more important for us at the New School because we're coming from a situation where there's a lot of conflict within the, the university in general. But what you create in doing, in, like, right, in moving towards this uh, sustainable or socially responsible investment and creating these, this committee on investor responsibility is providing a space where 
students, where staff, where faculty can, can come and sit together and talk about, talk about the variety of issues involved in the endowment and this field. So students are probably more apt to be concerned with the, the environmental and the social issues and trying to integrate them, though I think you know, you'll find, I hope that, that people here have already found that, that students are much more uh, sophisticated um, in incorporating all of these different elements. But I found, I found that, that my, at my university it's very, very important that this, um, that this committee and the work that they do, the idea of university shared governance, can be really, really essential, really positive, and, and really have a, a significant impact on how the community feels. Um, yeah, and just their view on sustainable investing as they see it as an opportunity, not just for the endowment, but for the com university community to really uh, develop and come together. Um, also for students, you know, outside, outside of, obviously I came into this concerned with social change and sustainability more than I was concerned with um, the financial side of it. But I mean, you know, even for me, it really has a, it is an opportunity in a growing field that I think only is going to, I mean, is only going to grow in the future, and that's important, especially, especially in terms of uh, the global global downturn we've uh, we've experienced. So, um, yeah, I think I think I'll leave it there. I mean, I think there are a lot of different there are a lot of different elements that are important for the different constituencies at the university, and it's important to approach them from where they're at instead of trying to create a a general framework and trying to use that to to talk to them. Thank you, Steve, Francis, Morgan, and Atlee. We have time for a few questions um, or comments. Do we have some here? Yes, in the back. Morgan. Oh, it's a great question beyond investing to uh, general aspects of the university. I just want to comment a moment on uh, the class that Atlee referred to at Columbia University that we uh, co-created with the chair of the Committee on Investor Responsibility. And this was designed as a service learning class. Um, it came through the engineering school of all places, just because that's where he happens to sit and had the independence to make the course happen. And we did um, half of it on helping the school develop proxy voting guidelines, which is essentially guidelines for how the school wants to address policies at corporations. And then the other half was used investigating community development credit unions and banks around Columbia University, looking into different proactive investment opportunities and creating a sample portfolio that was then delivered back to the committee. So these were, it was essentially a service learning class that had the committee itself as the client that they were supporting. Um, and it's a class that could be changed each semester depending on what the current needs of the committee are. So it was a way of expanding the capacity of the work. And I think that that's a model that could be used, whether it's with the Committee on Sustainability, if you have certain projects that you want to be able to outsource to different areas of the university, uh, it can be a great way to tie classwork into what the university currently needs. And I'm also happy to share that curriculum, Columbia's curriculum. Uh, feel free to, to shoot me an email at info at endowmentethics.org. Yes.
think it's, um, and this, this is Owen, um, I mean, you're really wanting to make the argument that uh, this type of activity will actually, your, your endowment will outperform the non-participants in, in this. Yeah, I, I, I have not seen specific data on, um, for universities. I think you can look at, there's, you know, I think there's, a ra there's been a range of academic studies that look at, um, and, and the, the, the issue here is just from a, a kind of research basis that there are very different strategies that fall under this rubric of impact investing, mission investing. So it's very hard to kind of think of it as a, um, a specific asset class or strategy because people pursue it in very different ways. Um, I would, if you were interested, there's actually, I think it's called SRIstudies.org, which has a kind of, you know, compendium of uh, all the different academic studies related to socially responsible investment and performance. It's not specific to universities, though, I don't believe. So that might be helpful. But I think it's, it's a challenge to kind of make a blanket statement at that level. I think you need, and what I, I and I think as you look at how you work with your, in, in your organizations, I think it is to look at very, um, first creating, as, as Atlee said, sort of creating a space where people who may not even think that they need to talk to one another actually have an opportunity to interact and then to find investment opportunities that are kind of win-win for everyone um, as, a, as a first step. I think that's a good strategy. Other people could weigh in on that. Yeah. So yeah, I don't have data just on um, universities, but I do have, um, I happen to have a, have a friend who runs a research firm that does sustainable investing so I happen to have data that he gave me so I could so I could talk about it um, the, the there there are a lot of studies on on SRI studies com and the the United Nations uh, principles for responsible investment is a very good place to go for uh, really detailed uh, studies on performance um, done and it's it's done by some of the largest asset managers in the world so again it gets it gets past that idea that it's a very small niche market that 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 Hippies from Vermont are, are doing it, though. You know, they're always good, too. Um, and, uh, at, you know, to go back to the distinction that I made between sustainable and socially responsible investing, um, from 2002 to the end of 2008, um, and this is a survey of uh, all of what, what this firm, uh, TrueCost, considered to be uh, funds within the sustainable investing universe. From 2002 to the end of 2008, the average return was 9 five percent as opposed to the S&P 500 which returned uh, a negative 2.19 percent and again and also just to give more current data sustainable investing performance for the first two quarters of 2009 was uh, up 7.63 percent as opposed to the MCSI World Index which is a, is a inter global index of uh, firms returned uh, 4.76 percent and SRI in that same space was at 6.75%. So, sorry to be sorry to be technical, but it does. There, I just wanted to to show that the that the returns are at least beating their benchmarks. I don't have the the mainstream financial returns, but they're they're surely they're surely competitive returns. I just wanted to add one small thing to it. In the two areas that I talked about, schools typically starting one um, shareholder advocacy, which is looking at the companies that are currently in your portfolio and communicating with firms to improve their practices. You're not telling the financial managers to move one dollar, right? You're saying we're going to stay invested in the exact same companies. We're just going to work to improve their impact. So from that perspective, you can say you're definitely going to make the same returns even if they might be negative, right? even if it's not the best idea, um, but that if you're not moving your money, you're definitely not going to have a change in the financial impact. You can argue that you're going to have an improved financial impact because, for example, if an oil and gas company is not looking at climate change, they're going to be in big trouble in 10 years. Um, and then the other side, in looking at proactive allocations and things like Shorebank, it's just cash, right? You're able to take the rate of return question out out of the picture um, by looking at asset classes where you have a fixed rate of return, you're able to say if we were getting 2% over here, we could get 2% in the social vehicle, equally government insured, there's no issue of rate of return. Um, so I think looking at where you start can also help in um, ensuring that you're not going to have a negative financial impact.
And on top of that, those were averages. And unfortunately, we're not all above average. So if your portfolio appears to be underperforming, this can be a great time to talk to your committee about ways of perhaps improving their record so that they're not underperforming at the same level they've been in the past. Um, I have a couple of questions um, for our committee here. Uh, Antley, how would you go about providing advice to your university on socially responsible investing? The advice I give is be able to approach, you know, be, be able to approach it from the variety of different perspectives that you know are going to be important to the different constituencies at the university. I mean, I've really found that you can't, you can't make the same argument to students and get them interested that you would make to, to university trustees and administrators. But to do this, and I believe to do it effectively, you have to, you have to reach out to the, to the broader, to the broader university community. I mean, because even, like, if, if your end goal is to get the university to move money into sustainable money managers, I really think that that's, that's only, that's, 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 that's amazing. But it's not, it's not all you can do. And the, the additional part of what you can do is get students involved, get faculty involved, develop the curriculum that helps, helps grow the industry as well as your university, and help get students who are actually engaged with these things who can make, you know, who can make a life commitment or almost a life commitment to helping corporate social responsibility, sustainability, and the, the general investing landscape. Thank you. Are there more questions? Yes. Question for Francis. How do you spot a bad or risky investment at your bank? One of the things that I think makes um, community banks a little unique in terms of how they engage with their customer base is that you know, we spend an inordinate amount of time with our customers at their place of business. And in the case example I gave of uh, Full Circle Farm, you know, we work with them for close to nine months in terms of understanding their business model, um, engaging a lot of their community understanding and what made them really successful, what, what was their vision for being a more sustainable organization. So in so far in terms of how we work to understand risk, you know, it's, it's really the old fashioned model of banking. You get to know your customers instead of having them apply in a document and you, you send it to a loan committee and you really crunch the series of numbers. Um, you know, you're doing a lot of uh, uh, you know, quali quantitative, qualitative assessment of organizations' vision, their performance uh, historically, but re really a sense of how they're going to bring their sustainability vision to the greater community. So it's it really a long-term, really intimate conversation with our customers is really the best way from our perspective to mitigate risks from a, from a banking perspective. Tweaking the system, making one part of it green, does not sufficiently look at the whole system. And one of the problems is animal welfare, how the animals are treated. That's not part of the triple bottom line. So we need something more integral in terms of a bottom line when we're looking at different kinds of business models. Could everybody in the back hear that? Um, his point was uh, the triple bottom line may not be adequate in some situations, uh, such as in a confined animal feeding situation, where we need to look at the welfare of the animal, and we also need to look at the whole cycle for the entire business model. Any comments? Yeah. You, you bring up an excellent point. In terms of our food system, it, certainly it's not very sustainable in the sense that of how the, the large amounts of animals we put through in a very, you know, a very stressful and very dangerous system in many respects. 
So when Short Bank goes out and then assesses that particular operations, you know, we did make a conscious look in terms of how the, certainly the size of the dairy farm and in terms of just uh, how they were treated. There, I mean, certainly there's very, very large-scale dairy operations. And unfortunately for us in our part of the world, you know, they, we don't have too many examples of that. So these are definitely smaller-scale, family-owned operations, which, you know, in terms of, you know, from an animal welfare, animal rights perspective, I think they were probably being better treated than a lot of, you know, animals in large operations. But certainly as a society, we don't do a very good job uh, understanding that, that particular issue in terms of just the... Uh, our relationship with animals, how they're treated, uh, I think that over time that conversation will become more relevant. But certainly from my perspective, our bank did try to really understand the, sort of the overall context. It, I mean, you're right, you're putting one element in and making it green. And, and we're, we can only change so many things at one time. But if we were to do more of that and then sort of incorporate that sort of social aspect of compassion, I think that would, uh, that would be a very good thing to look at. Just, I, I, I think what's interesting about this last conversation is that it highlights that once you move in from kind of the concept of doing impact investing into actually, you know, oh, should, should they invest in that or should they not, it gets to be a very detailed conversation. And when I work with my clients, that's where there's a lot of work that needs to be done at that level, actually defining what is an appropriate investment, what isn't. And that's what's intriguing about... Um, but Morgan, the, the course they're developing where you're working, actually developing investment and policy, uh, proxy voting guidelines for Columbia because you get into those conversations and you get, it has to happen at that level. It's not a, I think, it's not a kind of flip the switch and we now have a sustainable uh, endowment. Um, but, but you really, and there are questions that need to be teased out at that level that, and I think that for the field in general, that's where a lot, that's where a lot of the work still needs to be done. Um, just that. Yes. You mentioned, you mentioned course development. I was just wondering, um, are you seeing interest from MBA programs in incorporating these types of learnings where I would think they'd be most appropriate, at least from my point of view, at, a, at an MBA level, to really start looking at systemic change? I mean, we're looking at I mean, I think, I mean, I think in terms of the general topic of sustainability, MBA programs around the country are, are moving in that direction. Um, I know in addition to that, to the one class that we were talking about at Columbia, there is a, there's another um, class through the environmental school that, that is attracting a lot of the MBA programs in the, in the, uh, in the business school, specifically focusing on sustainable investing done by the, the, the VP of a firm called True Cost, as I was, as I mentioned, um, as I mentioned before. But the, I mean, the idea of it, 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 I do think that there's a good potential for it to grow and that it will grow. Um, I mean, it, it totally, on everybody's minds right now is whether as a response to this, to this economic downturn, these ideas of sustainable and socially responsible investing will become more mainstream approach. And they certainly, as far as I understand it, there certainly is the hand in hand with this type of investing side, the more the more larger and large and larger systemic uh, systemic reforms. I mean, I brought up I brought up a quote from John Maynard Keynes, who certainly has been out of favor for the last 30 to 40 years, maybe more, in this country. But those ideas of, of market regulation and sustainability, I, I mean, I think are, are certainly coming back into favor and will grow more so. Um, I think they're also. Um on, on the MBA side, but also I think it, the MBAs, as they look at where career opportunities are, I think several of the large financial institutions, um, you know, names like Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, have environmental uh, and sustainable, you know, the ESG research areas 
and when people can see that there are, I think there's a huge demand from MBA students to have these types of careers. The people I talk to, you know, they're looking for opportunities. Um, and I think some of the large institu financial institutions are, move, are looking at this not just as a kind of corporate citizenship aspect of what they do, but also as a kind of talking about risk management and how they, and then, and then those financial institutions are driven by um, what their institutional investors who are looking, they're, they're putting their money with them are asking for, which then, you know, leads back to endowments and, and, and institutions. So there's a whole chain that has to be re-engineered and there, I think there's things happening along that chain. And Steve, maybe you can talk about the course you teach. Um, I actually uh, teach a course at NYU. Um, it's in the School of Continuing Professional Studies in the Center for Global Affairs, where it's a microfinance and social entrepreneur course, and uh, in, uh, social entrepreneurship course. And um, so we really look at microfinance as a tool, but we also look at across, you know, housing, global health, uh, types of uh, where, where you can make investments uh, that have a social and environmental impact. So, and there, it's, a, it's very interesting because it's a professional adult education class. I get a lot of people who are from uh, Wall Street who want to do something different, and then I get people from NGOs who want to feel like they need to know something about investment. So it's a real, it's kind of an interesting framework. It's not part of an MBA course. Um, but I know th those types of courses are, are offered in MBA courses as well. But I think part of the challenge here is that um, this type of thing is kind of, it's, it's part kind of public policy, and, but it's also part finance. So it has to big figure out where that fits in. Yes. The question is, if you have a smaller endowment, or for that matter, any size of endowment, how do you do local investments uh, where you can put the money to work locally and um, still make a good return for your university? Um, I can just say a little bit about what we've done at my institution. We had a corner about a block from campus that had two derelict stores and a vacant lot with giant potholes in it. And we took some endowment money, worked with a local developer, and built a new home for our bookstore, which we moved just off campus, which we've turned into a community store. And in addition, have um, what I think is a pretty attractive and well-designed little mall associated with it. And frankly, we're doing great on that investment in terms of looking at it as a fixed rate return for us. And it took what was a horrible eyesore and turned it into a great new entrance to campus. So there are a lot of ways that you can put your money to work locally and we already heard about community banks that are local where we can put our money to work as well. Um, so those are a couple of fixed uh, interest rates but there are local funds as well. You just need to get your committees interested in taking a look at them, your investment committees interested in taking a look at them. And Steve, how would you go about starting to talk to your investment committee? Um, I, I think it's, I mean, what, what, what I think is interesting about this is that what we're talking about is not so much an investment problem as an organizational change problem. So I think is, um, I think it's really key to have one, um, 
as Ali would say, you want to make sure you're, what will work with one constituency uh, that you'll need to be another. I think with the investment committee, I think you really need to have an advocate um, who's pushing it internally, who's on the investment committee, have a trustee who, is, who, who understands what you're trying to achieve or is actually pushing the agenda uh, her or himself. Um, so I think it, you really need someone on the investment committee who understands what you're trying to achieve and, and push, not, not just engaging from outside. So that would be the finding your one uh, key advocate on the investment committee would be my first step. Any last words from our panel? Some questions. One last question. Um, yeah, that's always the issue that there are all these sort of middle people between the, organ the people who are supposed to be responsible for the money and actually where the investment decision is made through funds or whatever. Um, you can take, you can, that doesn't mean that they still are buying investments and you still have the opportunity if you want to pursue like proxy voting. It's, you still also know, you'll be able to look and see what's in your endowment. Um, I guess doing the, if, the, if they're not used to thinking in terms of, they do have someone who manages their cash, so then it becomes, it just, it makes it more difficult, but it doesn't make it, that it's not a, it shouldn't be a roadblock to doing anything at all. You just have to, um, you know, there are fund managers out there who do in sustainable investment um, and cash management. You just need to push through that. Um, Morgan, do you want to add anything? So I'm going to kind of combine answers to both of those questions. Um, I do want to mention in terms of small endowments, we've worked with schools ranging from two million in their endowment. This is College of the Atlantic, which is a teeny tiny school in Maine, up to Harvard with 35 billion and really see that there's opportunities um, for all different size endowments. We created a community investment program um, with that two million dollar endowment and there really, there really are opportunities across that space. Um, and I think the local investment piece is very important. Letting folks know, I think that's a big piece of it, that schools may be doing fabulous things but are not getting the word out. Um, we have a success stories page on our website where happy to promote any stories that people have of effective local investment efforts um, if you just let us know. Um, and then the other piece is just remembering in terms of investment advisors, they work for the school. Um, and sometimes they are hesitant to take on sustainable investment initiatives simply because they don't have the expertise and they're worried about losing that clientele. And there's been cases with foundations with, um, so for example, folks may be familiar with Cambridge and Associates, um, which a lot of, of uh, school endowments are managed by in addition to foundation endowments where foundations had gone to them saying, we're really interested in this sustainable investment stuff and you all need to have capacity in this or we might have to look for some new managers. Um, so it's important to say that this is what we're looking for. These are our values as a school. Can you fulfill this? Are you willing to develop this sort of expertise? And if not, there's other folks that are out there. But it's possible to work with existing money managers to make some of those choices, especially given that this is becoming more and more standard practice. They should know that this is coming down the line and expect to have to expand their own capacity. So some of the pushback may just be that they're not used to it as opposed to it actually being a, a bad idea so I would anticipate that and in addition to the endowments we've talked a little bit about operating cash and for those of you who are employees don't forget your pensions universities have new fiduciary responsibilities with regard to your pensions under the 403 B IRS um, regulations and if you don't have socially responsible investment options for your pensions be asking your folks at your university about it because they can provide those for you. Um, well, I want to thank our panelists for just a fantastic job this morning. And also to say that they have written a lot of good stuff. Um, the Responsible Endowments Coalition has a great report on their website entitled Maximizing Returns to Colleges and Communities. 
Uh, Atlee has done a fantastic job of writing an annotated bibliography entitled Sustainable Investing for the firm he's currently in interning with, which gives you links to just about every kind of resource you can imagine. Uh, and we've heard about Steve's two monographs. And in addition, um, uh, Francis has a fantastic website at his bank where you can see additional information as well. So there are a lot of resources out there available for you. And I encourage you to just take a look at them and start somewhere. Now I have two last announcements before we thank our panel. Uh, first of all, uh, Catherine Ressler may be interested in her driver's license. If anybody knows Catherine Ressler, we have her driver's license here or we will give it to um, the uh, front desk. And so if you see her, let her know or um, otherwise it'll get mailed to her, but it may be hard to get on an airplane. Um, and you heard about the session that Morgan Simon has going on in room 122 at 10 o'clock. Thank you all for coming this morning and let's thank our panelists.